Hi everyone, how are you doing today? Good? That's good? Awesome. So we're up to um, our second session discussing chapter line of Through the Mists called The Harvest of Jealousy. Who, who did their homework? Yay! Wow, everyone. It's impressive. <laughs> who remembers what the homework questions were? Yep. Do you want to tell me, Linda? If, just wait for the microphone. So we're just going to be passing the microphone from now on, guys. So that probably it would be good if you sit in closer. That makes it easier for passing, yeah. It was about how I've challenged the errors and stepped into faith this, this week, um, particularly with regard to the truths that were uncovered in Chapter 9 or any of the previous chapters. Yep, and the end of last week I set some specific questions. To, that's, I, I was probably those. not on YouTube yet. So someone who was here last week, if you pass the car in here. Yeah. I'm cheating because I only just listened to it again. Yeah. <laughs> but it was the, dif um, the difference between commiseration and compassion. Yes. Now, Karen, can I get you to hold the microphone that way? Oh, yep. okay, sorry. And can I just address something with you guys about the microphone? I've known all of you guys for probably, the majority of you I've known for four years, some, some a bit less than that, and we've been using microphones all that time. So I really wanted to um, draw to your attention today, and poor Karen has, happens to be the first person, but um, just the issue of love surrounding not using the microphone well. We've got speakers, so you can hear. You can hear me being amplified, and you can also hear yourself when you speak. If you don't hear yourself well, there's an issue of love that you're ignoring for everyone else in the group and everyone else who hears the recording. So um, I'll probably, I'm not going to bring it up again, actually, <laughs> but if, if I find someone's not using it well, I'll just say, look, there's an issue of love you need to look at. Can you pass on the mic? <laughs> because I really feel otherwise I become like a, a school mom or something. Where, and we're in a group together. I feel like when we're in a group together, um, it's not just about me leading this group. We're all giving in as part of this book group. And if it, if it requires me continually, like last week, there was numerous occasions where I had to say to people, could you hold the mic, could you hold the mic, you know, I'm gesturing. And it just shows a lack of awareness about what, where you actually are and what's actually happening around you. So, yeah, so that's my piece on the mic. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. What would, yes, one of the homework questions was, what's the difference between compassion and commiseration. commiseration. Yep. And what were the other... There was two other questions. Do you remember? No. No. Okay. Sandra? Thank you. The other questions were, did um, Marie's childhood create her life? <laughs> and, um, and how did her choices in life play a key role in what happened in her spirit world for her. Yep. Um, and how does her story relate to my own life? Yeah. Which was really yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Cool. And then the third one was about com compassion and commiseration. Yeah. And I've, I've still got another one. I'm not sure whether yeah. that was the question. Was um, what would have been different for her if she acted differently in her life? Yes. Okay. So I'd love to start with asking what... What do, what do we see in Marie's earth life? Last week we discussed a lot about her, what happened after she passed, didn't we? Um, but who wants to share what they saw about Marie's life when she was on earth? Yep, Glenda. She was brought up by a very wealthy family where she actually states that the supply of money was unlimited. Yes. And with that came power and abuse of that power. And she treated others really badly. And um, maybe it's an unloving way of putting it, but the thought that came to my head was she was just a rich bitch. Right. Yeah. She was very spoiled, wasn't she? Yep. And so if we, it, can you expand a little on the emotions of her being a bitch? We did see some of the emotions that played out in her life. What were some of them? Well, jealousy was the big one. Yep. Um, she interfered with others' relationships, so she took quite... A, she was very proud of breaking up others' love relationships and breaking mm -hmm. up um, friendships and marriages. 
So she was manipulative and jealous. What else? Do, can anyone else think of something that they saw in her description of her life? Barbara? Um, revengeful. Vengeful, yep. Or, yep. Wanting to take revenge. Is that the same as vengeful? I, I said re- oh, sorry, I said revengeful. Revengeful. Sorry. But I, 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 don't, I don't even know if that's a word. I, I, I don't know if vengeful is the word for wanting revenge. But I don't know. Yeah, what else? What about that's happened um, in her relationship with her friend, didn't it? But even earlier on, as she's describing her growing up, there's other feelings that were there. If, if we pass to Rose over here, yeah. She was demanding. Demanding. Unloving. Yep. And if we can be more specific than unloving, she was... Because all of these things are unloving. She had no consideration for anybody else. Mm -hmm. No consideration. It was all about what she wanted, regardless. Yes, so she was very focused on, Mm. what do I want? I'm going to get it. Yeah, yep. Nina? Nina? She had an attitude of superiority. Yes, she believed she was better than others, so superiority. What else? She just, oh, uh, yep, if you just go back here. Mary, um, she had an opportunity to help others through the church, but she thought it was good enough to just give the money. Yes, yeah, so, and. So she was un- really uncaring and cold. Yes, she was quite cold. And she says something, doesn't she, about going... She went to church functions and taught in Sunday school when when she wanted to get out of something else. (laughs) So she was very much invested in a facade, wasn't she? Uh, Yeah. Uh, Although not really invested in much of a deep facade, was it? Just that she should fulfil the social norms and... and, uh, Yeah. She didn't really even pretend to be that kind and good, did she? <laughs> yeah. If we pass back to Alwyn, behind you. Uh, she, was, she was really merciless, really. She had no mercy for anybody, really. Mm-hmm. Merciless, yeah. And very controlling. Yes, very controlling, wasn't she? Anything else? Yeah, wow, Rochelle? She was condescending to men. Condescending to men, yeah. She she thought that um, she had it all figured out with, um, what was his name? Charlie. Charlie. And she could just refuse him and it would build his character and then he'd come back and she'd be able to play with him some more. Condescending, I can't spell it. Even laughing with Sadie, you know, like having that. Yes. Good thing again towards the man. Towards the man, re- realizing that they could play with their affections. Yep. Okay. Anything else, Monique? She was possessive mm-hmm. of, of men and also of her um, relationship with Sadie, her friend. Yes. Yeah. She that had. She owned. She what, felt she owned them. Yeah. It was interesting her relationship with Sadie, wasn't it? She had, she had quite a few of these feelings towards Sadie as well, didn't she? She felt quite condescending. Um, so possessive, yep. Anything else? We saw in Marie, yep. Deb? Um, she was in, felt entitled. Yes, yes. So she was demanding and she felt entitled, didn't she? Yeah. And and um, and also overbearing. Overbearing, yeah. Uh, Lorleen? Uh, she was deceitful. Deceitful, yes. She was happy to lie and and pre- present the facade as well, wasn't she? Yeah. And she didn't even. Um, She didn't even really say anything to Sadie, did she, about how she really felt about Charlie or how she really felt about the situation? Yeah. Um, Just to carry on with that, it's um, part of the facade, but she was aware of her own acting, like Mm. she deliberately acted out things. Yeah, Yeah, so when did you see that happening? What happened? Um, 
Well, she chose to um, pretend a certain emotion which she didn't feel and then she liked to play with that. And then it just kept coming over and over. Each chance where she could reveal the truth, she just acted something else and she deliberately um, did so in awareness, not out of just circumstance, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. she made a choice very many times, didn't yeah. she, to pretend... And, and it wasn't, um, she wasn't even in some kind of self-deception about it, as you say. She, she actively made the choice to pretend something to a group of people and hold her feelings back inside and carry a lot of um, dark, dark intentions, really, for the future, didn't she? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anything else? If you go back to Gary... Yeah, um, just a lot of her actions were like, like you were saying, they were premeditated. Like it, it wasn't like a reaction or anything. Like she set this, she set situations up, you know, for to get gratification, I guess. Yeah, you know, so. yeah, yeah. And she, she was premeditated and planning about it. And that, there, there's a lot of um, condescension and arrogance in that position, isn't there? Thinking, well, I'm going to have this plan, and I know how everyone else is going to act, and I know what I'm going to get out of it. Yeah. Anyone else? Yep, Barbara, if you come forward. Um, I don't know if this is the right word. Um, she was quite dogmatic on achieving the end result and her a whole life was set up that, that she was, at all costs, she was going to achieve that. Is yeah. that being dogmatic um, or there's a... a do yeah, obsessive is probably a better word, okay. yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Have we got obsessive? No. No. got possessive. I knew I was doing double S's. Okay. And, and in that, she was um, extremely self-absorbed. Yes. For that one goal. <coughs> Absolutely. Everything was really about herself. What's another word we could use for self-absorbed? Narcissistic, yeah. Uh. Narcissistic. Yeah. Okay. Is there any more? Yeah, if we go back to Jennifer <laughs> and come across to Pierre, we'll, we'll come to you after. She would be considered the epitome of, of not being humble. <laughs> <laughs> Opposite of humble. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So she, she was quite arrogant, I, yeah, if we use that word for the opposite of humble. Yeah, okay. Uh, and Pierre, what was your one? Um, she's, um, she has joys for... Um, for the pain of others, she's kind of mocking and she's Lucky. laughing at people's pain. Mm, mocking is a good word, yeah. Yeah. So that's all the things she was when she was on Earth, in her Earth life, wasn't she? Very men, like all of those things really. And isn't it amazing that we can understand that much about her just from those few pages where she described her life? It's a good description, obviously. What did, what did we see when, in terms of her emotional state when she entered the spirit world? Diana? She was in a huge denial. She went into denial yeah, about all of this, didn't she? Yeah. yeah, that she was dead or any of those emotions. She was incredibly fearful and, and um, that was seemed to be an emotion that she'd never confronted. Before. Yes, yeah. And I, if we think about... All, just about everything we've listed here, what would be the natural, knowing what we know about emotions, what would be the thing that sits under all of those things? Yeah, huge fear. Huge fear. So she went into the spirit world, went into denial, and really went into denial of her own fear, didn't she even? And then what happened? What happened when she was drawn to Charlie? Yeah, Kel? Just beside you, Pierre. It all came up again. It did, didn't it? And this time, what, on. what were her emotions really towards Charlie and, and his wife? Um, just rage. Rage, <laughs> yeah. And uh, Barbara, if you... Yeah. At, at the end of her um, one-sided interaction, she was um, about to kill them. She was willing to kill. She became murderous, yes. didn't she? Yes. That was the level of her avoidance of emotion. She became murderous. Okay, so who could relate to Marie now that we've listed all of those things? 
<laughs> wow, that's pretty humble. <laughs> So a lot of you could see a lot of those similar emotions that have played out in your life or are playing out in your life, yeah? Laleen, if we pass back to Laleen. Um, I was just curious about the, um, the word righteous because she is quite righteous, whether that comes under arrogance or is that a separate thing in itself? Because it, that has a power in itself, righteousness? Yes. Believing you are right above i mean it all relates to arrogance and sort of as as jennifer pointed out you know it's the opposite of humility all of these things isn't it and righteous is a part of arrogance but it's a good descriptor i agree of of where she was at yeah yeah okay so lots of you felt you could relate to her so that leads to the question what was our um one of our homework questions was about how much do you feel that the way Marie was is related to her childhood? If we start with that question, that's not exactly the homework question, but how many of you feel that Marie is the way she is because of her childhood? Mm -hmm. Okay, who wants to talk about it? Who wants to, uh, yeah, if we go to Joy. I've been to Joy today. Yeah, you can see some of the um, emotions that she got from her, her parents and the environment. What what kind of things did you see coming um, from her well, environment? In her own words, she was willful and um, proud and expected to be obeyed and special and yep. And and so all of those things were there. And they ca- they <coughs> how do you see them relating to her parents? Well, I think she was a bit of a mirror of her parents. And she talked about that too in her friendship mm-hmm. with Sadie, that their relationship um, mirrored the competitiveness between their families. So it was obviously that that's the way her parents lived as well. So she absorbed some of this emotional condition from she, her parents. Yeah, She did. Um, but then, then over her life, and this is where I can relate it to my own life, you could see how every time that she chose an unloving action it caused more um degradation to her own soul as well as harming others Mm -hmm. and and the complete disregard she had for any effect she might have on others didn't even feel that it was her concern at all yes as long as she got what she wanted yeah um and she believed that was the way she could live and so every time she took those actions over the years her soul you can see her soul condition condition degrading and degrading and degrading and the actions she's prepared to take, therefore, becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and that's how it comes to the fact that she's quite happily to think to, of... To kill murder them. Yes. Kill a man I love, you know. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and there's a lot in between that, of course, obviously. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Thanks, Joy. Does anyone else want to... Um, yeah, if you just pass next to you. She would have been brought up by nannies and servants... And they would have treated her like a little princess. Mm -hmm. So that's probably where she learnt to just never be gainsaid. Well, yeah. And let's talk about this idea. So she obviously, through, and she talks about there being so much wealth, she could have whatever she wanted, couldn't she? So... So what, even if you think about now today, in, in, childhood, in childhood, many children are it's expected they should get what they want, isn't it? And so what kind of emotions do we see now in people who get everything that they want? What kind of emotions do we see? Are they... Yep, Jennifer? Yeah. Demanding, expecting. Yeah, yep. Demanding, expecting, feeling... Um, often feeling a sense of narcissism, that, we, that it, everything revolves around us and we should be able to get what we want. So then can we agree that the way that Marie was brought up had an impact on how she behaved? Yeah? Does anyone want to disagree? Yeah. Uh, Karen, got her hand up. I just wanted to ask about... Um there's an assumption that she's like this because her parents were like this. Yes. And part of me wants to say that can't, doesn't ne- necessarily have to be true because that means I would be the same as my daughter, you know. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, 
is it necessarily true that the parents, whether or not, if it's the parents denied emotion, that it's always the parents denied emotion that the child feels? Or like if her parents had come from a poor background and made their own money and wanted her to have a different life, would they still have that kind of stuff within them? Or well, this is what I really want to talk to you guys about today, is about what, it, what creates the people that we are today. And what, why is it that, Karen, you're different from your daughter in some ways, but you're the same as her in other ways. Mm. And why is it that some people pass in a very dark condition and others don't pass in such a dark condition and they're from the same family line? Mm. What, what is occurring? If you pass forward to Ange. It's the choices they make with what, what wounds they've got in them, isn't it? Yeah, essentially. So, but if, but say I was born in a terrible situation where I, there was no money and I was abused all the time and, you know, really horrible things happened to me in my childhood. And then I went on to do horrible things. Is that as a result of my childhood or the choices I make? The choices you make. Okay. Yep. All right. You're all saying that so nicely and like you really believe it. And uh, if we pass across to Samantha. <laughs> what did you want to say? Um, I was just feeling too that um, like Marie wasn't taught really any compassion for others and she wasn't really taught um, how to sort of have a moral compass in any way with her dealings with other people. So I feel like that would have had a huge part in the decisions that she made as well. Do you think she was unaware that she was hurting people? No, and that's the second part of it, isn't it? She still made a choice to disregard how other people suffered because of what she wanted. Yeah, because how would you define a moral compass? What is a moral compass? What, um, how do we, yep, uh, Jennifer? If we just keep each one on each side so that we, yep. Just simply to treat others as you would want them to treat you, and she obviously didn't do that. Well, yeah, and that's the thing, and that's a place where a lot of us often let ourselves off the hook a bit as well, isn't it, where we, we say, well, I wasn't taught those things in my childhood. My parents didn't model that. But if we're very honest, do we have an awareness of what we're doing is not nice, not loving, not is causing harm to other people? And if we have that awareness, where's the responsibility? Is it with us or with our parents? Yeah. Yeah. If you just go to Lorleen. Um, I was wondering myself about what makes me make my choices, mm -hmm. regardless of who teaches me or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was trying to go back and feel about why did I make the choices I did when I was little and I remember them and they were negative choices. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I went straight to, well, I was trying to survive all these sort of things. But um, when I got older, I could make choices again. And I was just thinking about, she did go to church whether you listen to what's been said or not, but they would have brought up this thing about treating each other regardless of what the parents did. Yep. So it's what came to me through the whole um, reading of it was, because um, I'm always going, poor me, why did I have such a terrible life? Mm -hmm. And uh, I can see um, the, the law of attraction that brings each event. She had opportunity after opportunity to make a choice this way or that way. Mm -hmm. And each time she made a choice that wasn't loving, the, ch uh, the opportunities got heavier, meaning the law of attractions became stronger. Mm -hmm. So then I went to the feeling of how would I make a choice if I didn't know about this law of attraction and, you know, the pain that I get from creating something. And um, I go back then to Fred's understanding of how he gauged without the same things, he had the same sort of yes. influences, 
but he went by his feelings mm -hmm. of what he felt was right for him. Even if he was wrong, he mm -hmm. said, oh, well, that's the way I feel about it. And this is what keeps coming back again about this, this what people refer to as a conscience. Mm -hmm. And that's where I came and says, okay, this is up to me to feel and to be aware of what's going on in me. And each time I deny my emotions, which is why I'll do things and be busy so I don't feel anything. Yeah. I can't make a choice. I just react to everything. Yeah. So that's where I came to in how would I know if I didn't know about the divine truth. Yeah. 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 And, and the truth is I see very many people um, excusing themselves, and I've been one of them in my life, excusing myself for doing something that's not loving or, or not kind or right when my conscience is already telling me that <laughs> but I excuse it because I think because usually because I'm afraid of something happening or because I think everyone else is doing it or whatever justification I use but the knowledge is still there inside of me just just as you said Lorene and and then even I see when people learn the divine truth, they, they still want to do it also. want to say, well, it's because of my parents and, you know, now I know wh what that damage did to me, so how could I be responsible for those things that I did? I didn't know any better and, and all of these things. And it's all a way of just avoiding exactly what you pointed out that Marie ignored and Fred listened to. And that is this, this feeling inside, this desire to, to reflect on, on self and to be a person who gives rather than takes or gains all of the time. Yeah, um, a few hands from that, Deb. If you, uh, other way, if you look, yeah. Uh, I had a I had a really good experience with this this morning because um, well uh, after last week prior to the end of last week I would have said yes her childhood created her soul condition or whatever yeah. and uh, but Yeshua uh, challenged that and I um, uh, opened up a bit more at, to that and um, realised that. Um, I, uh, well, actually, b basically, I got into a really big uh, childhood rage about not being allowed to feel my feelings because um, I was heavily shut down, you know, like we, we all were. Yep. And um, and I, I, just, I just kept on – like, I don't want to give myself an excuse anymore, um, Mary, because I think I've had enough of that, you know. But um, – but I did, I kind of kept coming back to it. So I just had a big tanty yep. and said to God, and then just the biggest kind of, that I'm still got to get my way through about just not being allowed to feel my own feelings and that I, I never said to myself, well, stuff you, I'm going to feel them anyway. Like I never, you know, I kind of just felt like, yeah, I had to be a good girl. But, but, but can you see, no, Deb, or what I see when you talk about it, I think it's great that you went and had a tantrum and just felt really angry about it. But can you... Because that's a part of actually the response to the addiction you have to not taking responsibility. Can everyone see what I mean by that? So when, when we're suddenly confronted with Jesus standing up here and saying, guess what, guys, you've got responsibility for what happened in your life. And we go, I don't want to take responsibility for that. <laughs> that's, you know, pretty horrible. Or for not what happened in our life, but for what we've done with our will. Um, when we have an angry response, that's actually the, the addiction to not taking responsibility being challenged by truth. Someone saying, you do have responsibility, Deb, for the choices you've made. And you feeling like, I don't want to. I don't want to have responsibility for it. I wasn't allowed to feel. I was in a mess. You know, and that's, that's just an angry response to the addiction not being met. I'm just repeating that a lot because I feel it's a really important point to get around around this issue I'm not saying it's bad though because you're going to have to feel the anger to and really but you need to recognize this is about an addiction to go ahead the bit, the bit I don't understand is that like whenever I'm processing I'm always it, it, like I almost feel like I'm almost living my mother's feelings you know I think of my mom I think of my sister and I just when you say you for them, I think they, how could they be any other way? Because they were so down for you must not feel, you know. So I just don't. I don't quite. Uh, choices I make as an adult, or once I'm old enough to realise others' uh, pain, 
I understand, yep. you know, yep. no problem. But I just don't see how, and I want to see, you know, what, how, how could it have been any other way when, you know, even sharing a room with my sister and she projecting at me all the time. I had nowhere to kind of, you know, maybe I should have crawled under the, the covers and waited till the middle of the night to cry. But okay, Deb, this is, this is what I want to say to you. It's the, where I was heading with this is... You actually have pain inside of you. Oh, man, I've got to master this whole whiteboard situation. It's really challenging me. It's, I think it's too low or something. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a developing skill. You, anyway. Um, um, there is pain inside of you relating to the feeling that you were not allowed to be little Deb, to be yourself as a child, that you were suppressed emotionally. There's, there's a real pain about that. And there will be a grief for all of us when we come to recognise the fact that we, because we were shut down, we have made some bad choices that we are now responsible for. That's another grief. When you get angry and you feel... You said you got very angry with God, didn't you? just before you told me you, you felt very in a rage with God like I wasn't allowed to feel my feelings and now I have to be responsible for this stuff but at the same time you told me that you felt it's almost like compassion for or a commiseration is perhaps the best word with your mum and your sister who actually did the shutting down of you didn't they yeah. so can you see that when we that's another avoidance of this issue when we get angry at God, who he didn't shut you down at all, but we feel commiseration for our mum and our sister who did shut us down, we're avoiding a truth. Well, I was pretty angry with mum and dad too. But what you expressed to me was more about this rage with God. And, and it is something that I, I see for you, is that there's a willingness to be angry with God about the way things are, but not a willingness to accept the truth of what happened. And that's the first step to actually getting through this process. So the truth of what happened is that God didn't shut you down. People around you shut you down. And you might have some anger about that. You do ha definitely have an addiction to not taking responsibility for your life. And I'm not just speaking to you here. Like, just about all of us have that addiction. Um, that is very confronting when someone tells us, well, actually, no, you are responsible. And that's often why we have resistance. But this is the magic line here. Under here is where the real healing starts to happen when we get down here. But at the moment, I feel you are so afraid of the grief of even just the feeling of being shut down so often, how crippling that felt for you, and the grief of what you did as a result of that, which is uh, the beginnings of repentance, you know, recognising what we've done. You're so afraid of those feelings that you would prefer to be angry, live in, create an addiction that I don't ever have to take responsibility for my life, and even be angry at God about it when the truth that is associated with this grief is that people around you shut you down your mum and your sister and your dad shut you down from feeling. And that's, the, that's where truth is so important in this process. The truth is we are responsible for the choices we made and the truth is we were shut down and we, we need to connect to that truth if we're ever going to grieve, fully come to feel the truth of what we've done. And then you're trying to make yourself, I wish I was better as a child. I wish I had known how to take responsibility as a child. And that's not the place where we're saying you have responsibility. Marie didn't have responsibility for the family she was born into or the, all the wealth that was loaded upon her. But as Lorleen points out, as she grew up and she became exposed through the law of attraction to different people and events and churches and everything like bringing her to this moral compass that Sam talked about, then there's a lot more responsibility upon her soul. But she's, she's... And that's the part that we have to grieve about when we ignored that. We can't, we can't go back to our childhood and take responsibility. In fact, it was really hard for us to take responsibility when we're two, three, four, five. Um, 
And that's the part where you're trying to say, oh, if I had done it then, if I had felt then, then I, then I would have been all right in my adult life. But that's, that's coming at it from the wrong direction. What we need to do is feel the grief of what happened to us in our childhood. And to do that, we have to acknowledge truth, which starts right up here with the truth that we have to take responsibility for what we've done in our lives. And part of taking responsibility is working through these layers so we do get to the grief of what was done because then we'll never do those harmful things again. Is that clear to everyone? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, any other um, comments about um, Lorleen? I think what um, came about was a clarity for me more about the addictions. Yep. Um, there's one part where she had an appointment with Charlie when she met again and she refused at first and then she decided, yes, I will, I will do it because she wanted him. Mm -hmm. And um, because her desire to have something met was so strong, she didn't listen to her first refusal and she then chose differently. Yeah. And the consequences then followed. And what it explained to me was um, at that moment she knew something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. But her addiction was so strong she didn't heed the feeling that this wasn't right. And for me was always, I'm asking this question now, what, what, what are my addictions here? And I, just, I don't know what they are. But it is at that moment when I have a feeling that something's not right that I can then go flip it over mm -hmm. and then say, well, there's some addiction here because something doesn't feel right. Yeah. And it helped me to clarify that. Yeah. That's awesome, Lorleen. Like, that's the kind of self-reflection you need in order to grow towards God, to really be aware of yourself in your day-to-day -day life. And, and like, what am I feeling here? What, you know, with all the knowledge that I've received up here, what am I feeling here and how can I begin to marry the two into an ethical, moral kind of a life? Um, yeah, yeah, lovely. If we go to Julianne at the back. And if we pass your mic forward to Barb, we'll go to her after. Mary, I didn't see that Marie reflected on whether or not to to be with Charlie. I saw it as a cat and mouse game for her. Yeah, I, I didn't know either there. I, I had sort of had the feeling that she was still playing she with his affections. Playing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, it was just part of the whole game. game. Yeah, because yeah, the purpose was she went there, mm. and and it fell in her lap, and she also, Charlie. I didn't feel she she loved Charlie. Her greatest revenge was against Sadie. She, when he left, when he came with her, she was so enthralled and so happy that he had left his wife and children, mm -hmm. and she had reap the ultimate revenge against Sadie. So I didn't feel that that was a love of Charlie at all. Yeah. Well, clearly, from the beginning, she didn't display love for Charlie, did she? She wasn't interested in how he felt coming to propose to her. She wasn't interested in how he felt when she refused. She wasn't really interested in why he had chosen now Sadie. She didn't have any love or connection with him. I agree it was a conquest for her and a power thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So poor old Marie, she had some pretty dark emotions running there, didn't she? Yeah. But I thought Lorleen's point was lovely just in the fact of it's true, we do have very many opportunities to pause and reflect often. Yes, yeah. I agree. That yeah. was, yeah. you could get, you could actually, I felt that, that you could um, um, feel that, but it wasn't what I felt Marie was feeling, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. Thanks. 
Barbara? I was going to say exactly the same thing, but uh. it's beautiful that Lorleen had a beautiful experience out of it anyway, so. <laughs> y yeah, well, um, what I love about Lorleen is she's often thinking about how is this me? How is this, mm. how is not, not just the emotions of this person, but how does this experience relate to what my life experience has been? This, uh, yeah, I appreciate that a lot about the way she reflects and interacts on with the book, yeah. Okay, Pierre. If we pass forward to Pierre. Uh, in my life, it has been... I, I've tried very hard to do what my parents wanted from me. And always it brought me pain. And it, it was not feeling right. Mm -hmm. And the more I tried, the more I, I had pain. And this pain was what uh, motivates me to look for something else, mm -hmm. that there is something wrong in what happened to me in the past. And it felt, it was quite easy for me because I felt quite a lot of pain, like something, I'm not me, there is something I don't know, but it's not right. Yep. And so I've looked for it all my life until I, I, I find divine truth. But for her, it feels like she was uh, enjoying her life. So it's just like, it feels like she had no, not such a pain um, she didn't f feel the pain from her decisions and her, her thought and, uh, mm -hmm. like I did. And it's, it feels like to me pain is a big help <laughs> Often when you it's start a reflecting. Often it's a big oh, yeah. indicator, yeah. So why do you think she didn't feel pain, Pierre? Well, it feels that she, she rejoiced from her life. She, she was enjoying all the, what she was doing, mm. it feels like. Mm. And and there was certainly pain, but there was so much joy, obviously, from... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, know if we can call it joy. So mm. what was the satisfaction she was getting from life? Can anyone else... Um, Diana? She was having all her addictions met. Pretty yep. much that's how it felt. Yeah. And I could relate definitely to that when I look back, and even now. Yeah, you know. yeah. So she was. She felt very comfortable in her life because everything she, because of her position almost with wealth, she was able to meet every addiction, wasn't she? And she talks about that period where Charlie went off and married Sadie, and and um, she she got better physically, and then she just lived with her wealth in a way that would help her avoid all of this this pain of of what had happened and her wanting. Charlie back for herself, yeah. yeah. Monique? Um, one of the questions that I remember being asked last week was um, how do we justify an extension on how we're parallel to, to um, Marie's life was how do we justify our unloving behaviour? Mm -hmm. and, um, and and after reading Marie's, Marie's story... Sorry... What's going on, Mon? I feel um, so self-conscious that I just want to leave my body. <laughs> yeah, and this is often what happens for you when you suddenly get very emotional. It's actually because you just, you need to feel uncomfortable and you leave your body and a spirit comes and has their emotion through you. I often see that happening for you, you know. So if you can just be with yourself and express what you want. Another thing that often happens is that you begin to project out that everyone make you feel comfortable with what's happening. And so both of those things are just avoiding the feeling of discomfort. So if you can just be with that and have a go at saying what you want to say, that'll help you. Okay. I feel that... Um that seeing Marie and the amount of demand that she has and that I feel like I've been the parallel of Marie, that I've been, like most of the things on the board has been myself, mm -hmm. but also the way that she's justified it and myself have justified it, that, that I look back at my childhood and say, well, I didn't have anyone who taught me. Yeah. So I'm allowed to be a bitch, a demand, you know, demand all these things because I didn't have anyone and it's only when someone actually stops and be, is in truth that I actually 
that makes me reflect. Not that I actually want to, but I actually am kicking and screaming just like Marie yeah. that, that I want to still rebel. And um, I just was really, tu- I feel like Marie, oh, I was really yeah. touched by that. Yeah. And, and I feel like even though I say, well, it's, I know intellectually that I have a choice to be loving or unloving. I actually don't feel it in my soul that I, I want to make the choice to be loving often. Yeah. And it's only because because I can't have my addiction met that I ha- that I that I'm forced to change. Yep. That's a good realization to have, Mon. This thing where we go, nobody loved me, so I don't have to be loving or I can't be expected to be loving. Can you see that you can see that that's an angry place, can't you? I think you just expressed that to me, that there's this, this angry feeling inside of you, like Marie, like, I don't want to, I don't want to, ha- and to be honest, I feel that in a lot of people in the group, you know, this feeling like, right, well, now we know the truth that nobody loved us, it's, it's all crap anyway, isn't it? And I, you know, how can I be expected to be loving and how can I take responsibility for everything I've done? Because clearly it was their fault and all of those kinds of feelings. And, and you said, like, often you find you don't actually want to make the loving choice. Can I, yes. can I say that's because there's still anger covering that addiction that I just talked to Deb about. It's all about I don't want to take responsibility for myself. Can you see that if we have a generation where love is not well understood, it's, love is not well practised, given, understood, and that gets passed on to the next generation where love is not well practised or understood, and then that gets passed on to the next generation, there has to come a point. Now, everyone in each generation can go, well, my dad was an old bastard, so you know, what can, what can you expect from me, really? I've done my best, given what I had. And then the next generation can say, well, mum was really horrible to me. She was completely absent. What, what can I, I'll do my best at mothering my own daughters, but gee whiz, I can't really do much better than that. Every generation is actually ignoring the truth that they could learn about love. Because remember, God's created this whole universe to bring us truth through the law of attraction. They're actually living in anger and saying, I don't want truth, God. (laughs) I don't want to make a different choice. I want to keep my addiction to not taking responsibility because it helps me avoid my pain. And I'll just stay angry. And every generation succeeding is injured in love and we actually become more injured in love. It takes some people somewhere to say, I've obviously been injured in love. (laughs) But God wants me to know the truth about how to love. He's generated an entire life experience where if I desire it, he will show me how to love perfectly in every situation. But I'm going to have to give up this addiction to not taking responsibility. I'm going to have to desire to heal the pain of what's come to me through all these generations. And that means giving up my anger, my angry response. And just what Lorleen was saying, that we, we don't... Like, like, I've been so terribly unloving, but I've, I haven't been willing to face that, that pain or that conscience that, that, um, that, that is actually our moral compass, like it's there, but... Yeah. Do you remember we talked about this in one of the earliest chapters we talked about um, where's the responsibility? Uh, He said, uh, I can't remember which chapter it was in, but he talked about you, you, you must take responsibility for what you've done on earth, the actions you've taken, unless you were completely oblivious to them being unloving. Do you remember that? And we had a lot of discussion about and I discussed it at Cobra as well as here, I think, what, what does it mean to know that you, that you don't really know what's loving and what's unloving? And it's a pretty fine line. We came down to pretty much, you pretty much know when you've been unloving. Unless you are raised in an environment that is completely bereft of any kind of moral code, and then you live in that environment without exposure to the outside world, because basically the outside world is designed to bring you that at at every moment, then really you are responsible for the unloving actions you take. 
Yeah. And this is, this is the point that really AJ was trying to raise with you guys last week. Because we see Marie enter the spirit world and wow, she's in a lot of pain, isn't she? It's pretty dark, it's pretty horrible. And the feeling amongst some of you is like, how, you know, she had a bad childhood. How could she be expected to go through that? And the truth is she had many opportunities. As we heard, she went to church, you know, she knew what she was doing was really unkind. And she wasn't even, like, she wasn't even immune to the pain that she could see that she was causing in others. She could see it happening, but she still made the choice. And I suppose when I said, who relates to Marie and you all raised your hand, it's pretty tough to come to recognise that we've done that same thing, isn't it? Where we have explained a way to ourselves that I'm going to take this action, I know that person doesn't feel good about it, but I really want the approval of these other people much more, so I'll, I'll be shaft with that shop assistant or I'll exclude that girl in the playground or I'll, you know, um, toy with that guy's affections or, you know, treat him unkindly, you know. They're all things that we've done that are like Marie, aren't they? Yeah. Someone had their hand up at the back, Gary, yep. Yeah, I was just um, reflecting on that, the consciousness or that, that inner, like, compass of what's right and wrong and sometimes... We use that to excuse our parents. Like, you know, we said, oh, you know, my daddy just drank or my dad was absent. And he didn't know, he'd any, know any better. better you yeah. know, and I suppose, like, and that's how we, like, justify it. But just li listening to the discussion, like, God, God would have brought them um, situations where they could have reflected, you yeah. know, is it right when I hit this kid or is it right when I come out, you know? Like, they yeah. must have felt something somewhere, you know. I, yeah. I guess we're designed somehow to feel but and they just I guess chose not to yeah but it's sort of not an excuse that they didn't know about divine love or they weren't into God or exactly you know yeah they, they were they were, our parents were had opportunities I, I guess that they just um denied and why do you think like that's a really important what you said Gary I feel and I can feel even your emotion yeah. like why do you think we resist actually coming to that realisation? Why do we just go, well, they did the best they could? Yeah, well, then we'd have to take responsibility. We'd have to take responsibility for our lives. So, yeah. And yeah. there's something else that happens emotionally that started, was starting to happen for you as you were saying that. I had some grief coming up. Yeah. 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 And yeah. What, do you know what that grief is? Um, that I guess... Your parents like deliberately chose not to, to you know, to hurt you or to, you know. That they ignored what God was sending yeah, them to yeah, show them about yeah, love. They, they yeah, they ignored it. Yeah. In in favour of their addiction or th something, they they wanted to avoid their emotion more than they wanted to learn how yeah, to love. Or yeah. To, yeah, to love me. And that yeah, yeah. that what does that lead to a feeling inside of ourselves? Pretty unloved, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. We just pass forward to Cornelius. You had your hand up, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> it's kind of like the um, moral compass is kind of like a, like a switch, it seems, isn't it? Like there's a switch to choose to feel or not to feel, and the switch is turned on when you feel, and a lot of our parents, I suppose, turn, turn theirs off. So we're being guided by a compass that doesn't work, and we, we can actually choose to turn it on, I guess. Yeah. But you, know, I agree. I agree, Dave. But to me, it feels like it's a pretty regular choice. It's not something you do 20 years ago and then suddenly change it back. Like, I feel that the way that God's designed everything is that when we're in a state of not feeling, we're making that choice pretty much minute by minute, hour by hour, because all of our life is designed to connect us with ourselves. And, you know, it takes, it actually, something that I feel about as I go on is that it takes so much bloody energy to keep my emotions in check, actually. I can think I'm trying to get to them, but really I'm, when I'm trying and I'm not getting to them, it's because I'm, I'm in fear about something. I'm avoiding some, some step in the chain of anger, fear or addiction that I don't want to feel. But really, when you begin to feel, you think, my gosh, that was exhausting trying to keep my emotions suppressed for years and years. That addiction was very tiring. I did it, you know, I was at the pub every Friday night for like three years and I had a lot of hangovers. It wasn't very pleasant, but, you know, I was doing that to keep some things in check, to keep avoiding some unhappiness. And that was draining and that was a choice I made every week. 
So, so yeah, I, I agree there's kind of a, a, a switch, but it's a pretty... You've got to use a lot of force to turn off that moral compass and, and it is a choice that we make, I suppose. That's what I feel, yeah. Mm. <coughs> if you just pass behind you to Lorleen and over here if we pass to Christiana, yeah. Um, I had a, a thing on the weekend. I happened to mention something to my mother and her instant reaction was, um, yeah, you know how depressed I was and I didn't, I was so, you know, stressed out and, and that's why I did what I did. And I looked at this and I had an opportunity with my own daughter, mm -hmm. who happens to be here with me, and um, she, she started saying something, not the same, but it was actually incriminating me. Mm -hmm. And I know the difference between, in the past, I'd go, I'd get tight and I'd try to defend myself because my interest is myself. Yeah. And um, when AJ said in the past, he said, do you realise that the damage that we cause to our soul or something like this is related more to how we treat others than what's happened to us? And I felt yes. that was a very, uh, like I thought, hmm, I wonder about that one, you know. Because <laughs> I always felt so much damage caused by my parents. Yep. But then when I took that opportunity when my daughter was saying something in truth to me, but it was painful, I actually heard her. I actually didn't turn off and start feeling like... Well, I have all these reasons why I did something. Even if you did that, yeah. sometimes you do that emotionally, put up yeah. the barrier. Well, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I actually sat there and I just let her speak and I heard her. And in hearing her, I could feel her. And then feeling her, I then felt what I'd done. Yeah. And I could see this happening with my mother just on the weekend. The difference that I make when I allow that choice again to to um, what you say is soften, yep. not defending my right, my uh, narcissistic state of always protecting myself. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah, beautiful. And that's how you can commence repentance, is when, when, we, when we make it all about us, and I wrote up there, addiction is all about me, it's about how can I defend my castle, really, is everything that addiction, creates addiction. Um, and it's all very self-focused and self-centred. And when you had that experience with your daughter of just for that moment taking down the barricades and letting her feelings, actually connecting to her feelings, that's the moment where you, you can begin to feel what you have done and also, that's, that's the start of repentance. When you, allow, you desire to feel what she feels as a result of what you've done. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Christiana? I don't know whether this is still relevant, but um, I was feeling um, that at many times during my parenting, there was times when I was reacting or punishing my child or whatever or going about something that in a way that I'd learnt from other people and various things that I felt to respond to in that particular way. And at that very moment, there was times where I thought, this feels so wrong. This feels so wrong yeah. and I wish kn I knew a better way. It just, you know, I'm doing something that's not right, you yeah. know. It's, yeah. And I just couldn't draw on what else to do at that particular time. And, you know, it's like as if you know, God's placed the moral code inside of you and that every now and again it just bubbles to the surface, that it comes up, that it just sort of knocks on the door and says, yeah. hey, you know, you yeah. could possibly do it a, a some other way. Yeah. And then, you know, from that it would sort of sit with me and I think, ah, oh, you know, and then I would sort of start searching and just sort of looking around to see if there were, was other ways and then eventually sometime years later I would go, oh, that's it. Yeah. That's how I could have done it. Yeah. That's how it could have been better or whatever. And then there's this huge grief that goes in that how long it took me yeah. to find what the more appropriate, more loving way would have been. And what do you think slows down? Why, why does it take us time? Yeah. Why doesn't it come instantly? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just 
the references, I suppose, that are around us that we see, you know, we immediately look, well, how are they doing it and what's happening over there? Yeah, so what is that emotion that leads us to do that? Yeah, I suppose we're looking for, we don't believe that it's within us, that 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 answer is within us, so we immediately look out for yeah, other people, Yeah, I think perhaps. something else. A few hands went up over here. If we go to Sandra, yeah. It's kind of like justifying and still looking for that answer. To me, it means like I want to know that what I'm doing is still somehow right, like justifying yeah, it. Yeah, and how, who gets to define what's right in that situation? The society. Or so, yeah. We look out of ourselves rather than inside of ourselves. And should we be looking inside of ourselves? Like, where is it that we should be looking? God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even, even when we say we don't know about God and the fact that God's created all of this whole universe to bring us his truth about the best way to do something... Can you see that even if I didn't have the emotional investment, say Lizzie, Barb, you and I are all mums and I'm parenting in this way and it, oh, I read it in a book, it doesn't seem that good, I don't like how it's going. Um, I'll just see what Lizzie and Barb are doing and I'll try what they're doing. You know, and, but the immediately, what's the feeling I have towards Lizzie and Barb? Like commiseration in a way, like expecting that... You know, that if we're all in the same boat, it's all right. Let's just go with the full mass kind of feeling. Like yeah, the there's kind of a fear, isn't there, in me even, that, you know, like yeah, all, lots of emotions, especially yeah. around motherhood of like, if I do it differently and everyone says I'm a bad mother, that's the worst kind of person. Yeah. Mothers should be, you know, you've got to be a good mother, if nothing else. And it should be inherent in you. And it's just natural to be a mother. And, you know, it should just flow out of you because it's just a mothering thing. And, you know, a mother's love is the most pure. Like, all this stuff makes it like pretty scary being a mum, hey? <laughs> And I've got to do it right. And what if Barb then says I'm crap at what I'm doing? And, you know, what if Lizzie points out that that wasn't very good and she's got the way sorted out? And there's, But in the end, I'm just looking for their approval, aren't I? And that immediately clouds the clarity of truth I can have. Every emotion out of harmony with love clouds it. When I have this feeling of, like, I want the truth and I don't care if it means I look like a bad mother while I do it, I want to know how to get there, then, then things really heat up for us and we get a lot more truth more rapidly. And you often hear that people, when they go through something very extreme, where they are almost brought to humility by life, <laughs> um, and they don't care anymore how they look or what happens, suddenly they have the most life-changing revelation they've ever had, um, and they write a book about it. Um, <laughs> And they don't realise that it all came about because they just got to this really humble place where there was no investment anymore and they really opened themselves to truth coming. Yeah. Is it like because you've got nothing to lose pretty much at that moment? Yeah, like well, you, you're, every investment that you were holding on to, every addiction, can't be satisfied. So you do have, you know, we all think th that addictions are something bad to lose. They're really good to lose. <laughs> But yeah, the feeling is I've lost everything that made me feel good. So, and, and that's suddenly you're in a state of humility. You're with your own pain and amazing. If you look at really people who've made amazing discoveries, who've had amazing revelations, like very many of them went through this process of being humbled by their experience in that they got ostracised by everyone. So, oh, can't meet that addiction of getting everyone's approval. Their family rejected them. Oh, well, that's my whole self-concept I've got to come to terms with. You know, all of these things happened and then then they found truth. <laughs> um, and it, partly because of their commitment to wanting truth that they lost a lot of those things sometimes. But usually it happened when they were in a very humble place. Yeah. Can I ask another question? So with Christiana's case, what she was saying that there's this kind of feeling something's wrong, mm -hmm. is it still just a case of really just resisting, resisting really and fear of being wrong that really stops us from... that we kind of know it's, we're feeling it, but it's like, I know I'm wrong, but it's kind of like still, I'm, not res I'm still in resistance to the truth of, because of the fear that's really in place of not being whoever we perceive ourselves to be. Yeah, well, and sometimes we're just afraid of not knowing. 
we go, this is wrong, but what am I going to do instead, you know? And so it just stays as a niggle until we find something that we think, I think that's better, I'll go with that, you know? Instead of facing the devastation of going, everything I've been doing is wrong and I don't know what to do, <laughs> which is actually the most humble place. Yeah. So AJ and I just did an interview about humility, uh, the fifth in the series, because <laughs> I like the subject. <laughs> but we talked about doubt, and he was talking about how doubt is our investment in an inaction. You know, if we just hold on to doubt, then we don't have to ever make a choice. We just, just stay in the state of doubt, and it's not even really a feeling, it's just a state that we get into that helps us avoid very many emotions and actions. So, yeah. Thank you. Kel, no worries. Um, so I think that's, oh gosh, how, how do I say it? Um, for me, in the past week, just been feeling a lot into my own security. It hits right at the core of my security and my survival and getting my needs met by somebody else where I grew up um, so afraid that I was going to die yep. because I didn't have... You know, like Marie, I didn't have everything given to me and in a sense of entitlement, but I didn't have anything given to me and had a sense of entitlement at yep. the same time. And, yep. and so I was very angry from a very young age. I remember being angry yep. somewhere. I was so afraid. Yep. And then um, started to get mad about that and get myself heard and mm -hmm. want to be heard and... Um, then started expressing all my mother's and father's denied emotions. Yep. And um, all around me, my environment was addiction of alcohol and drugs. And But I, I saw, even from a young age, that that didn't work mm -hmm. for them. And all I remember deciding, if it was just one decision, loving decision, because I made many of all, like Marie's, unloving ones, was I'm not going to drink Yep. And cover it up, uh -huh. and um, do all that that path. And so all around me, I had everybody at me, like, "What's wrong with you? You don't, you know, you don't want to have fun. You're just mm -hmm. so serious." And I just got that barraged all through my teenage life, yep. you know. And so then I still chose to to be angry. Yeah, just it's sort of like it's I I did know I was being angry but I and I justified it somewhere well they're you know they're terrible they're just making a mess. I'm right and yeah, I'm angry yeah. so it's okay yeah. yeah and at least I'm not drinking and yep. taking drugs I'm yep. trying to you know yep. be loving and truthful and, and so really were you any better no yeah no not at all we just all. had a different addiction a different expression yeah. of covering over the fear yeah. yeah yeah and that's taken me all the way through you know and justifying it and but it really can't comes back to I think my security and my survival and wanting my needs met and mm -hmm. being afraid yep. that I'll be ostracised and I'll die. Yeah. And um, it's driven me, I feel like, you know, it's like a runaway freight train that I cannot stop. That, but you can. But I can. And my, yeah. I've always thought, I think I had the realisation that it was like, like a physical, I had to physically stop this runaway freight train, but... No, it's emotionally and yeah. as soon as I realise that it's in my emotions and that I can do that, you know, if I pray enough and to yeah. God that um, even this past week, you know, hyper aware of my choices and how I respond to, to my partner and, yep. and, and it, I can feel the rage come up and it just wants to be driven so much outwards and so then wanting to... So, Kel, yeah. what's happening for you right now? keeping going <laughs> why is that happening because I don't I want to avoid yeah and there's that feeling also isn't there from your child I want to be heard I want to tell my story yeah, yeah. that feeling and, so and, yeah sorry often when you talk I want to go the go for the point Kel yeah. go for the point because you tell me lots of other things and then sometimes you never even get to yeah. the point yeah it's, it's I find it a hard one I've thought about this in the um book group about being personal but still relating to the story and the chapter yeah it's really an emotional place yeah yeah so it I love it when 
you guys share from, wow, I have this realisation and this really... But sometimes there's the feeling in some of you, and it was just there for you, Kel, about, oh, I, I kind of want validation for what I've been feeling about and I sort of want to be able to... Yeah, I want to be able to connect to the group through my experience. When really... Um, the best way that connection happens in our group is when we're all connected to ourselves and we just um, we share when it feels appropriate or when when the law of attraction kind of brings us that opportunity. And for some of you, like it challenges different addictions, doesn't it? And that's why I had to stop you because I felt like, hang on, I'm letting Kel just go in something here where there's there's an emotion there for you to look at about just the investment you have in sharing. Once you heal that, you'll share your own experience and it'll be really flowing and giving. But often now there's a, there's a real kind of feeling of like, could you make this okay for me, what I'm sharing, as I'm sharing? And, and that tends to make you get more expansive as well. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for stopping me. No worries. Yeah. N Nina? I have a question yeah. about the chapter. Yeah. There's a period where Marie goes into a, a space, what she calls termination, where she went into oblivion. Yeah. And I'm a little bit curious about that. I don't feel like I understand actually what happened for her at that time. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit last week. Does anyone remember what we said happened? Just... You talk, Nina, you're talking about when she goes, she enters the spirit world, she's freezing cold and um, then... I feel she suffers. It's um, on, in the <coughs> printed out version, it's page 100 and it's of the termination of that period, I have no recollection whether I suffered until pain wearied itself out in the intoxication of its own excesses or whether the intensity of my torture became an anaesthetic and lulled me into sleep of agony remains a mystery. I only know that for a space my existence lay in oblivion. Mm -hmm. Okay, who remembers what we talked about this last week? Who was here last week? I was. <laughs> yeah, you were, Nick. <laughs> uh, yeah, Gary, do you want to... Is it? Where's the microphone on this side? If we just pass to Gary, yeah. Um, was that when the law of compensation had sort of taken effect? And yeah, she'd been in this really freezing state and then she went into fits of rage and then she kind of... It, it was almost like uh, she wore herself out with her rage, the expression of it. She was so engrossed in it that she actually collapsed in exhaustion surrounding the rage. But it, it was part of the, the expiation through the law of compensation, part of her dealing with the law of compensation was feeling all this pain because she was resisting it through any other way. She created all this pain and then there was sort of this lull where she sort of exhausted herself. And we talked about the fact that a small amount of pain had left her in that, in that time. But then, of course, she came out of it still in fear and she, she was resisting that and was immediately drawn to Charlie again. Yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank cool. you. All right. Let's go back to the chapter. Any other questions about the chapter, Monique? Um, just a question on page 100, just the um, paragraph before that, where it says, I was slowly being, I was being converted slowly into a frozen, a block of frozen, mm -hmm. yet living flesh and my abnormal sense of feeling heightened as the infernal transformation went on and I just wanted to ask um, <clears throat> the infernal transformation mm -hmm. does that mean that she was humble it sounded to me like she was humble no I think she was being transformed she was being transformed into a block of ice that was the transformation that was happening and infernal means um, terrible doesn't it it means this horrible thing that's happening, this horrible transformation where I'm getting colder and colder until I become a block of ice, yeah. So she was, was resisting her fear and it was... Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any... Deb? Yeah? 
Uh, th this one's more in the physical, but it's just something I don't understand. And I have heard the thing before. When she, before she died, she went, in, she, she went into like a brain fever, delirium, and, and how the emotions debilitated her physically. And like I kind of thought I could keep up with the best of them, but I, I'm still sort of able to, to, to function. You know, uh -huh. physically, I just don't understand that. I don't. I don't quite understand that an emotion can wreck you physically. Well, every physical issue that you have in your body is caused by an emotion. Every wrinkle, every grey hair, every ache, every pain, every um, every every mole. <laughs> mole. Oh my mole. God. Yeah. <laughs> well, some of your moles are are not. Uh, Injuries, yeah, freckles and things. You mean, or like I, I didn't have them before. Yeah. I, I started getting moles in my forties right. that, right. that I think were a bit unsightly. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. So all of those things, yeah, are caused by an emotion. But, so. but this idea of like collapsing, I kind of, I, I just don't know. I just don't really understand that because I don't know why my mother hasn't collapsed till date to date. You know, and I have. <laughs> I went. <laughs> How are we all still, still standing, alive? You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really could, and, and also in earlier that's the times. Force, that's the life force that God has put in us. Like the power of our soul is pretty strong, isn't it? When you consider what we're shutting down. Yeah. yeah. But perhaps we need to look at Marie's emotions. Like we've all said, yeah, we can relate to different aspects of Marie's emotions. But... And what she went through when she passed is very extreme. And many of us, if we remain in our same emotional condition, would experience something very similar to that. But she is, she is someone who has a murderous intent inside of her. And she obviously... Um, the, the law of attraction compounded so much in her life that she reached a point of crisis, basically, surrounding her addictions. And that is why I think she fell into a collapse. She couldn't, she couldn't um, meet her addictions. There was no other... And there's not a lot of other substance in her life, is there? It's just all addiction. And so when, in that moment when Charlie married Sadie, everything that she had gained a sense of good enjoyment from her life from was suddenly gone. Her best friend, the guy she wanted to mess with his heart about. And... Has, have any of you ever just fallen very ill, very suddenly? Actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have. Yeah, yeah and can I you see it was at a time... connected at the time? I don't know. When oh. you were resist... The, either a time of great change, where change is sort of forced upon you, or a time of crisis where you completely resisted emotionally that, that event in your life. And sometimes it's not even what you would classify as a huge event, but it's obviously an event that... Um, triggered something fairly huge from the past that you skipped over. Very often people fall into illness at that time. Okay, and why? Like, you think that if you were then on the, on the floor, yeah. you, you might start crying, possibly? <laughs> but, so we're so in a rage we don't consider being humble to... Yeah, well, it's the same thing as your other me. question, okay. why aren't we all dead? Why aren't we all crying? Like... <laughs> That's the strength of our will, I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, she, she does have a pretty strong will, doesn't she? She's going to be an awesome angel, Marie, <laughs> because that will is awesome, you know. She's used it very negatively in one direction. As soon as she turns that boat around, it's going to be amazing. I often make that joke with AJ about myself <laughs> when I finally <laughs> use this will in a good way. <laughs> she was one-pointed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. You just pass straight back to Glenda and we pass over to Diana. I had a hand up over there. Yeah. Um, to me, my, my personal answer to Deb's question is what we discussed in Chapter 8, the difference of um, mercy and justice. Here on earth, we're shown mercy. Hmm. So, it takes 40 years or something to have a face full of wrinkles or 60 years or whatever, depending on our emotions. But that that's mercy that we're not collapsing and dying so much younger isn't um, it um i don't know i don't know if i 
I don't know if that's logical. I think the mercy that we have here is that our environment is not reflecting our soul condition at all times. We can all be in the same room and, you know, people in the hells associating with people from the fourth sphere and oh, we can do all of that in the earth plane. And there is, that our life is not restricted by our soul condition until we pass over. The law of attraction is always trying to show us things. Um, I agree that partly because of the pristine human body that we're given and the the gift that God has given us in the way that it works is pretty miraculous, the way our body is able to heal itself. That, that does hold us in good stead in terms of living, <laughs> despite us using our will in an unloving way. But I think that... Um, we can't necessarily say that the person who gets cancer at five does so because they have an extremely worse soul condition than the person who gets, only gets wrinkles at 40. Do you see what I'm saying? Because if we followed your logic, we would say that it's mercy that means that I don't have cancer, but what is it for the child who has cancer? Um, and I see very much here that um, there's a lot of spirit involvement with our physical body and sometimes that maintains our physical body for periods of time because we receive a spiritual energy and also sometimes that causes huge illnesses in in some of us who don't have such a bad soul condition but we have a specific injury that a spirit can connect to mm -hmm. yeah um do you do you have it is you feel the same way yeah okay yeah yeah thanks glenda uh, yeah. We, oh, sorry. Die, and then we go to Trev. Yeah. Are you still? Oh, yeah. It was just more about that Marie's collapse, and yeah. and then going into that place. And for me, reflecting on that, it's um, it reminds me of all the times and how I still do at times in my process, like going like like it's this huge like furious rage thing, mm -hmm. and then it's like the end of a tantrum, and I'm going to collapse in exhaustion at the end of it. You know. Yeah. And it feels like, and I can relate to this little child. Oh, in you're me. talking about in the spirit world yeah. when she has the collapse. Yeah, yes, sorry. yes, yeah, yes, that, yeah. That collapse yeah. in the yeah. spirit world. Yeah. It, um, and maybe as a child, Marie did the same things. Where if she didn't get away sometimes, had a bit yeah. of tantrum or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so that's sort of how it felt for me. Yeah. Yeah. Although I, I did have questions about whether, you know, she was really wanting to find another place but even in that place in me it's like I'm like am I ever going to get this met that I'm like, looking for <laughs> yeah and that's I, I agree that's what she's sort of having she's in so much resistance which is what we are when we're having a tantrum that she's just enraged but that's that's part of the pain that she's creating through the law of compensation and and through experiencing that pain that's what the law of compensation is like you walk through an experience of pain and as you are living with the pain it's part of slowly working your way towards a better condition but it's a very slow process. If you consider how much pain Marie caused to other people in her life, she would be like that for centuries and centuries because it's not, it's not just the pain I caused Barb um, and the pain I caused Sandra in one event that I... You know, I'm experiencing all of the pain that entered Barbara as a result of that, then all of the pain that entered Sandra as a result of that. And it's not sort of like I can't double up. I'm, I'm doing that as much as I'll bear that pain... Um, that's how long it's going to take me. Yeah, the extent of that back to back. If we go to Eagle, yeah. I was just I was just wondering uh, at, at her moment of suffering in the spirit world, uh, what were her guides involved with at that time? What, what were they doing? Well, obviously they were standing by, going, "I hope she makes a different choice." If she makes a different choice, we're here ready, we're here ready. When she has a sincere feeling in her heart that she wants to face something, we'll be here, we'll be here. Yeah, that's what they were doing. And, you know, at different times we talked about last week how spirits became involved with her. They would also be there with their hands tied going, I hope we can, you know, intervene soon, but at the moment every law of God is working against us to intervene. 
because she's actively choosing not to feel. The spirits involved with her are actively choosing not to feel. But they would be trying to generate things in her environment to um, bring her to an awakening of herself. So they would be there present. It's whether she wants to um, acknowledge them or not. Yeah. <coughs> it was that moment when she saw Charlie, was that part of the, the gift? That no. If you think about what happened when she saw Charlie, she actually went back into a, a condition of causing more soul damage to herself and other people, didn't she? So, yeah, yeah. I don't... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it felt for me like it was her chance to do the right choice when she saw him again, you know, and she didn't. Yeah, I think really it's a continuation. She hasn't yet made a choice in all the time that we, that we know her before Fred meets her. She hadn't yet made a choice to actually want to change. And so her attraction to Charlie is just as a result of that lack of choice also. You know, she still hasn't properly entered the spirit world, the hells in terms of wanting to face her condition. She was still in a state of avoidance. D did you want to add to that, babe? No? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. If we go forward to Nora. And I just, yeah, we've got a little bit more time. Yeah. Yes, in relation to that, <coughs> I was wondering if she was in such a, a denial and resistance and everything else, mm -hmm. like we, most of us do. Um, is she actually, and I don't know if this question was actually already uh, answered last week because I wasn't here last week, or oh, last yep. time. Yep. Um, is she in either heaven, uh, like in the spiritual world, or is it that she's still earthbound? Yeah, so this is a question that was asked last week and I didn't, actually by Karen, I think, wasn't it? Um, and I didn't answer it very succinctly. I feel that she, she has not yet left, she has not yet properly entered the spirit world. She's still, she's in a location in the spirit world, but she's still wavering between being. Earthbound sort of tends to indicate you are staying on the earth forever but if we could just or for you never left if we could use the word earthbound in this sense of someone who hasn't finished um carrying out damage or you know live trying to live out their injuries on the earth in that case yes she's earthbound so she's gone to a location in the spirit world but she's been drawn back to the earth because she's not finished with harming and avoiding and all of those kinds of things so yeah Okay, uh, if we come forward to Sandra, and then I just want to get back to our a couple of questions before we finish. Yeah. So I'm still relating to this issue um, yep. about, I guess, mercy on earth. Like, I have this idea that if you can't handle the pain anymore on earth in the physical body, you either die or leave the body. And it seems like once you're in the spirit world, you can't die anymore. So you are going to have to handle all the pain that there is of what you've caused to others. Yep. And it seems like that's part of mercy on earth that we can Definitely. just leave. And well, I don't know if it's mercy. It's a part of an exercise of our will. Right. Um, the mercy that is here is that we, our lives are not restricted or limited. Our learning is not limited. Uh, like our our opportunities for a broad range of learning is not limited by our soul condition. Uh, and I still don't think I'm expressing that exactly as I want to, but if you think about here on earth, we can avoid pain, but that's an exercise of our will and our decision, I don't want to learn that yet. So it's not necessarily mercy as, as it is our own will. When we pass into the spirit world, then... Um, you're right, we can't die anymore, we can't avoid the pain, and that is a part of justice. Um, but I don't know if it's mercy, it's not really part of God's love that, or his desire that we would avoid learning, but it is an operation of his laws that we can avoid it if we want to. <laughs> um, and there is mercy in the fact that when we avoid learning, we are not immediately faced with the consequences of that. So we have the chance to make a different choice again based on the use of our own will. 
Do you see the distinction I'm trying to make? No. A lot to it. I okay. Feel like That's all right. The bodily, you know, I'm talking about the body being um, the loving thing, like being in preschool kind of where you feel the pain but then you're leaving. But I do, s I'm, I am blocking what you're saying. Like I'm not feeling the yeah. actual answer. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about mercy as opposed to will and justice. So when you're here on earth and someone's harming you when you're a child, is that what you're talking about? No, I was talking more about when you get sick, like, you know, when you're in that painful, like, you, your body's so, in so much pain, you can either leave the body or you, or you die. I, I'm yep. not sure if you can die from pain, but I'm assuming this. So I'm just saying that, yeah, yeah, I guess... I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just saying that you can't die anymore, so then you have to face more and more pain when you do die. So the pain is kind of like a gift in the way to go, there's something wrong. Like, why am I in so much pain? Am I supposed to be in pain? So it's like a gift on earth yeah. that allows us to kind of go through and not have any more pain once we pass over. Yeah. So what I want to make the distinction about is about the use of your will as opposed to mercy. You're right. When we pass, we can't avoid the pain anymore. And that is a part of justice. When we're on earth, God is merciful in that he's saying, you're going to make mistakes. It's, I'm going to give the opportunity to rectify those mistakes without you having to live in a hovel. Um, you can be in a hovelish condition and you can still make different choices and work yourself through that in this beautiful environment. And, you, you know, you can do that. And there's this time delay thing that is happening so that you have more opportunities to learn in a way that is comfortable and you can have more contact with people just through the law of attraction. You don't even have to have your desire in operation for you to meet someone in the third sphere. You, just the law of attraction might bring you that to help you. Whereas once you reach the spirit world, you've got to really want it to bring that person to you. So that's mercy. When we choose to leave our body when we're sick and avoid pain, yes, God has allowed that to happen, but I feel that that is us using our will to make an unloving choice, to choose not to learn. So it's not really a function of mercy as it is of our will. Do you get it? Totally. Yes. Now I understand what yeah. you just said. Yeah. No I worries. I wasn't from pain, clear. you know? Like, so if you die from pain, yeah, it doesn't. It, yeah, absolutely what you're pain saying. Pain is always a result sense. of resistance to yes. emotion. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, the Thank choice you. not to feel. Yep. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Two more questions that I want to cover. One of them was about commiseration versus compassion. And I want to go back to what Gary was talking about with his dad earlier. Oh, I don't know if it was your dad, but you're talking about dads and, and people um, saying, well, dad did the best he could uh, or mum did the best they could or they didn't know any better. Now, what, what is the state of compassion versus commiseration with our parents? Kate? I feel like um, with commiseration, we're getting involved in the emotion, whereas with compassion, we're outside of the emotion and we're, we're loving the person, like that they've got some damage in them. Yeah, and w when you say we're inside the emotion, can you explain sort of that agreement? a agreement? Yep. Like, um, yeah, we're sort of allowing and agreeing. And what are we agreeing with, essentially? Uh, I guess with the resistance to take responsibility for the error in love. Yeah, we're kind of, we're kind of saying, it's okay to have that error. It's all right, I can see you've got an error. And really, emotionally, we're kind of allowing or agreeing with that error being there. We're sort of justifying the error within them. So if we contrast that with compassion, what would compassion do in, with regards to truth and error? Uh, well, I feel in a pure state of compassion that there will be a firmness about the truth and about the issue of love. Yep. But there will also be present a love for the person at the same time. So sort of the opposite of what most of us are used to, like we're used to when there's a firmness, that there's an anger or a... Yep. Or a... Um, or a punishing feeling. A negative, yeah. Yep. An anger, punishment, yeah. Um, whereas I feel in a pure sense, then there will be a firmness about 
the lack of love that's present, but there'll be a love and a, you know, a desire that the person heal as well. Yeah, so I, I think you're exactly right. When you are commiserating with someone, you're saying your error is okay, and actually, when, are we really loving them in that situation? Because we're actually helping them avoid error, and usually why do we do it? Yeah, because we want something ourselves in that exchange. So it's actually usually an addictive situation. Whereas compassion, we are firm for truth while still loving that person. And so the last week, what state did you feel most of you guys were in with Marie? Commiseration. Definitely. Uh, and there was a feeling of like, oh, she, and we have it a lot when we, like, when we interact with many people in life or ourselves. It's been hard for them, so, and there's this real commiseratory feeling of like, oh, that's really bad, and I can understand that, and oh, it's really tough, isn't it? And, and all the while, there's no feeling of like truth in the situation and there's no real sense of love and it becomes very, if you feel it's kind of soppy and it, nothing much happens from it, does it? Whereas when someone really loves you and gives you the truth, wow, that's confronting. But if they do it with love, you can often, like you feel the compassion also, don't you? And that's more empowering for change. And when you catch yourself being in commiseration with someone, what do you think that's meaning? <laughs> Yeah, Deb. Um, well, it indicates that I've got the same thing going on or something relatable. It, it comes back to me, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, so if we're in a state of commiseration when we read the, the story of Marie, what's it telling me about me and my own approach to myself? Alex? Kate, if you just pass the mic to Alex. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's to actually avoid our own emotion. Yeah, we actually, yeah, we want to feel like it's okay to avoid emotion. And this is the thing that AJ really felt from the group last week that everyone was like, wow, you know, and she went to the spirit world and that was really hard what happened to her, but hey, look at her childhood. And, and it was all a kind of a big commiseratory feeling rather than recognising the responsibility she had for the life that she had led and also the power in the truth of what she had now available to her. Yeah, Alex? Um, I, I just um, felt like saying before that um, I feel like the commiseration happens before we feel the emotion. The compassion happens afterward. So it's well, we can't really move yeah. from it. Doesn't naturally flow into each other. Like if I'm no. in a state of commiseration, it's going to block me feeling, isn't it? Yeah, I, I guess I'm just going from my own personal experience when I haven't wanted to feel. I've, you know, wanted to excuse and justify my parents' behaviour and so, yep. um, because I didn't want to feel my pain. Yeah. Um, but I feel the compassion um, will come at the end once I've felt my grief. Because mm. what's, the, what's the dynamic that's happening as we delve into the relationship with our parents? What is, where are we on this place of forgiveness? Oh, for me, I'm nowhere on that. And what needs to happen for us to forgive? Well, we need to fully grieve. Fully grieve, yeah. yeah. And until we forgive, can we love? Uh, not in a pure sense, no. No, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't believe we can fully love our parents until we've forgiven them. We can have a knowledge of truth, which will lead us to be less angry and towards compassion, but I don't feel that we can fully love unless we remove the the hurt from us which is pretty like that's something that really leads me to want to feel a lot because I would love to be able to love everyone yeah 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 okay if we go to Jennifer and then I just want to move back to the chapter yep um one of the reasons that I participated in commiserating with Marie was that <coughs> um is that I didn't want to admit to how painful my unloving actions have been towards others yeah. and that, that she actually um, was receiving a just um, 
response from God's laws. Yes. And I felt when I read it that um, it felt unfair. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it. I just don't want to see that my own unloving actions have really hurt people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I feel that's why most people want to commiserate with her rather than just really face, what does this mean f for me? Yeah, for where I've come from and what I've done. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, we've got a little bit of time left and I would love to finish with what we see in the end of the chapter. So after we've heard everything about Marie's story, we've heard about her earth life, she's told Fred about that, and then she's told him her experience in the spirit world. What do we see in the environment that she's in now and what do we see in her? Where is she in the spirit world? We touched on this a little bit last week, but yeah. Sandra? It feels like she's in that place of, okay, I've admitted, I'm admitting my error now because she's been helped by Kushner and obviously she was open to feel it. Mm -hmm. And she's in this um, place of recovery. So the, she's climbed up a little bit up the level of, of love that she's in. Yeah. And um, yeah, but I really find it, can I ask this question to do with this? And I wanted yep. to ask last week, how is it that she's able to see Kushner's house because obviously he's in a celestial um, heaven. So I just wondered like how beautiful that is and also how it's possible, you know, because I imagined that it was all, the spheres are basically universes. So how can, you know? So do you think that she's seeing Krishna's house in the celestial heavens? No, okay. No, she's seeing Krishna's house in the sphere that she's in. Okay. So you don't just have to have one house when you're in the spirit world. Oh, so he's got a house there, so she could yeah. see him. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good yeah. question. But yeah, yeah, I was really confused about that. Yeah. And I was just trying to figure it all out, and obviously I wasn't feeling into it, so <laughs> thanks. If you, if you ever get AJ on to talking about the houses that we've got in the spirit world, it's quite interesting. <laughs> There's lots. Anyway, if we, Julie, the back. Thanks, everyone, for passing around. That's Thank good. you. Yeah. Yeah. Mary, I just wanted to reflect. Once Marie, f um, she's obviously in a much better condition where she is, mm -hmm. does she then have to go back with the law of repentance and compensation and everything? So she's here for a time, but then she still has to work through the injuries that she has on her soul. So, where do you, what sphere do you think she's in at the moment, Julie? A very good one. <laughs> she's in the first sphere. Yeah, but yeah. it's not where... It's not where she passed. No. It's quite starkly different. Yeah. But remember, as they're going there, it gets darker, doesn't it? So, so they're, they're going down to a lower condition to where Fred has been so far exploring things. And with regards to the laws, how, like, how do you think she got to this location? Through Kushna. Through Kushna alone? Oh, no, she had... A, what did a, she have to do? She had a desire she put out to either God or the devil. Yes. You know, yeah. like, she didn't care which one. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a, a tiny desire to, for help. A tiny desire for help. And remember the thing that we talked about last week? What was her feeling? Remember Graham asked the question about it. Uh, and I talked about the point she reached just before she got help. What was she willing to feel? Yes, she was willing to feel her grief, her pain. The fires she of hell. To she know. was like, yeah. bring it on. I'll take yeah. it, you know. <laughs> um, so what, what is she shifted in a law there? What did what laws did she shift between? Um, from compensation to repentance. Yes, yeah, that was her first step towards engaging the law of repentance. Because she wa remember when we're engaged in the law of compensation, we're working against God. We're working against. We don't really want to feel what we've done. But God's saying, you're going to have to feel it. <laughs> it's all there around you. As soon as we say, okay, I will feel what I've done, then that's the beginning of us engaging the law of repentance. But what do we see? Well, Fred, Fred 
do you think it's all done and dusted for her now? Is it all on the way up? Or what, what do we see? If you pass forward to Glenda. Yeah. It says here that um, gradually she changed into the woman she had once been until great beads of perspiration stood on her face and her eyes dilated with a maniacal gleam. So she went back into feeling those emotions, like where she was living was actually a respite from that. Is it a resp... So let's talk about what's happening there. What do you... If you pass next to you, Glenda, Sarah, what do you feel is happening there? Um, she's... She's at a point now where she's worked her way up from where she was, but she hasn't quite committed to moving ahead yet, and that's why they changed their robes because they need to be really compassionate to her to... And he describes a few different things about she's still stuck in the fear of where she was and not quite having the faith and the hope to move forward, and she's so she's in this place of rest, hoping that she can move forward. But yeah, it's not certain. It's not certain, is it? And it, and there's an amazing uh, description of that, isn't there? Where they talk about even the blades of grass and everything's reflecting this conflict. That's ha she's on. She's on a. An, an edge, isn't she? A knife's edge. Which way is she going to go? And you're right that everything is geared there towards compassion, towards love and showing her truth. And Glenda was mentioning how she goes into this huge emotion, emotional experience explaining the, the experience to Fred and yet she's in this place that's not hellish. How, how is that happening? Anyone? Uh, yep, if we go. I'll oh, go to Ange. Oh, I felt it was because she was willing to feel her emotions, taking yeah. responsibility. Yeah, and that's that's the point that I wanted to highlight to you guys is when we don't fight God, everything that God's created supports us. When we fight God, He's trying to point that out all the time <laughs> and so you know we end up in a, in a really horrible condition look at the different as glenda points out she's not finished with all those emotions but she's she's starting to want to feel them she's engaged now in a process and even though it's not sure which way she's going she's she's been supported to move in this way and because of that her environment is much better so it's and this is this is the thing that uh, I hope that we talked about it clear enough today. We've highlighted the point clearly enough today. But there's a lot about the use of will. Like it's a very rich chapter in terms of lessons about the use of will. She, because the, the condition she ended up in, remember we've talked about a lot of times in this group, what, what um, causes the place... What, what um, affects our soul condition the most? What affects where we enter in the spirit world the most? And we've talked about the difference between what happens to us in childhood. We've talked about that a couple of times here together. Um, the difference between what the injuries we absorb as a child and how our will impacts on it. How we use our will as a result of those things and how it's the use of our will that has the biggest impact. Now, for Marie, she entered the spirit world using her will in absolute opposition to humility. As soon as she's made some shifts into humility, already her environment has become a place that will be conducive to her healing and resting and, and being loved through this process. And there's a lot of love, isn't there, that's demonstrated in, in where she is. She can, as Sandra said, look at look at Krishna's home in the first sphere and she has space to feel and she's what what is even the purpose of Fred coming to her Nina if we pass wisdom oh, yeah thanks by being given the opportunity to tell her story it enables her to connect to it yet again on another level yeah yeah and it's assisting her with humility isn't it she's as someone pointed out last week she just lays her life bare for this this stranger and says this is who I am and this is what happened and it helps her develop in humility it helps her deal with the emotions that were there and it also helps Fred doesn't it to understand another lesson which is what he wants to do he wants to understand how this whole spirit world works yeah if we go back to Graham um, 
it seems to me like his purpose in this was he was allowing her to process her emotion, like by speaking through it in a humble way, she got to relieve all the emotions. Yeah. And then she must have hit it causal, I suppose, because she then collapsed and fell asleep. So is that like the relief at the end of, of the emotional process? Yeah, well, whenever we connect to an emotion that's, that's really deep and um, cathartic and it, it does actually impact upon ourselves, things leave us when we release causally and there is, there is the need to rest and recuperate and, and um, really that's the time when we can open ourselves to receiving more love as well. But yeah, that's what we're seeing ob observed there. Because do you see in the way she tells her story, she's not avoiding her own condition anymore. She's not avoiding the pain that she caused to others. She's really starting to engage in a repentant process. She's at least recognising the truth of what she's done. And through that, she's connecting with very deep emotions yeah, and she's resting afterwards. Like it must have been part of multiple versions of that. Like that's, you know, yep. she must have got done a lot of that before she got to this point and this is just another step. Yeah. So what does that, how does that relate to us? Yeah, we've got to do it over and over. <laughs> Will we be doing the same thing over and over? Well, we may be reliving the same experience, but we may be going into it more emotionally each time. Yeah, or different aspects of it. And experiencing more repentance. Yeah, yeah, totally. So that's another lesson that we can learn from this, yeah. yeah patience, <laughs> yeah. And sincere desire, you know. She's not engaged in this to try to get to the end of her causal. She really wants... well. She's in the balance, but she's being assisted in a process to understand how to heal her soul in a real way. And that's a process that we all engage in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if we come over to Joy and if we pass forward to Karen over there, you had your hand up. Um, Mary, in the spirit world, Jesus is not teaching everybody about the law of repentance like we're lucky enough to have. So it's just a question of is waiting he? until I automatically... I don't know. Is it just waiting until I automatically get to the stage where they want to repent? That they go from the law of compensation to the law of repentance? Do you think that Jesus is the only person who's ever taught anyone about the law of repentance? That's true. I'm saying a Jesus or someone like that. No, in this case, was anyone teaching her about the law of repentance or just waiting naturally until she was ready to be repentant? Is the question, I guess. You mean, was someone standing up, sort of giving her verbal instructions about the law of repentance? Yeah. Is that the distinction you mean? Yeah, or? you know how um, in previous chapters we've read about the fact that someone will come down and visit people yep. in lower spheres to see if they're ready to move on. Yeah. Um, but it just felt in this case that, well, she'd already been doing this for 20 years before Kushner came along. And, and remember, Kushner was there a lot of times yeah. trying to help her. help her. So he was already coming down mm. to try and help her and help mm. lead her out of this place. So mm. I feel that he's teaching her a lot about the law of repentance. Mm -hmm. But there is a crucial point I feel that you're hitting on, and mm. that is we can't truly begin to engage repentance mm. until we reach the emotional state of desiring it. Yeah. So we can hear about it and mm. think we would learn about it, but we don't ever really engage the law and, and the soul healing process until we actually desire it. And that's what had to happen for her, isn't it? Yes, getting into the soul state of wanting to be sorry for it. Yes, yeah. yeah. Or at least I think she really just faced, realised that she wanted to face it. And because she's still in the balance, isn't she, in terms of there's still these emotions that are being carried with her and there's a, there's a sense in this chapter of will she go back or will she go forward and how much is she going to stay the course with this? Yeah, yeah. Nina? I think it's a beautiful example of how pain can be a great motivator for her because I don't feel it's so much a desire to repent that's driving her but just the absolute agony of her existence has driven her to the point where she'll 
do what's needed just not to feel the pain. Yeah, yeah, well, but ironically, isn't it, that she had to reach a place where she was willing to just feel pain before things would change for her. She was in this state of I'm resisting it, I'm resisting it, I'm resisting it, make it go away, make it go away, make it go away to the point where she was like, okay, I'll go to hell, you know, just, you know, just get me out of this vicious cycle that's not going anywhere. I'll, I'll face the fires of hell. And in doing that, she shifted into a state of humility. And, and so... Yeah, there was the pain of the repetitive not going anywhere cycle that was happening. Yeah, that, that taught her something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if we pass back to Alwyn. However, did she, had, had she now got to a position where she understood that, that, you know, she'd made bad choices, so therefore she's less likely to go back and do that stuff? Is that where she is now, do you think? I don't know. Is that what you think? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I think too. Yeah. yeah. I think she couldn't have told Fred the story in the way that she did unless she'd realised that she'd made bad choices. So I feel, I feel there's not much danger of her going back. But, but I guess what they're reflecting in the... What they're feeling is the struggle within her soul of like how much she's having to face and how, you know, how it's sort of... What's going to dominate here, the fear and the rage or the desire to move beyond it? Yeah, yeah. Yep, we go to Christina. Oh, Karen, you had your hand up, sorry. We go to Karen first, yeah. Back to the storytelling. Look, I, I'm well aware of the um, uselessness of storytelling unless you're completely emotionally connected while you're telling the story. Um, but before when... Um, at the beginning, when you were pointing out to Monique that there's spirits coming in, feeling an emotion, yep. I was asking myself, you know, when I'm saying something and I feel very emotional when I'm saying it, I just wondered, you know, I wonder if that's... I'm allowing spirits to do something and I'm not actually... Do it. Like, how do I tell the difference? Well, if you go back to, you remember when I was speaking to Monique, I was telling her she actually wanted to avoid an emotion. She, she said herself, I feel really uncomfortable, and she wanted to go away from that. And because of her wanting to go away from that, often then spirits come. For Mon, oft, and she's not right here, oh, there she is, yeah. Often what happens is when you, when you come up to an emotion you're really afraid of, you skip out of that, but you know you've got to feel emotions, so other spirits come in and just have other emotions for you, you know? It's almost like you feel like you need to be feeling, but there's a, there's a resistance to really just feeling what's actually inside of you. And so if you contrast that, when you're, when you're speaking to someone and you feel really connected to yourself and to the truth of what you're saying, it's, it's very likely you'll connect emotionally to what you're saying. But it is, it's about having an integrity to your sense of self. Like, are you staying with yourself? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, if we just pass to Monique, if you come, if you just go back. And, and now I'm just learning when I'm actually going out of my body. So I actually did say, I actually want to leave. Yeah, and, and that was it good. really hard to that. stay. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't, sometimes don't, I don't have the desire. I'm just saying to actually stay. Sometimes when it gets too tough, yeah. I want it easy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I just want to leave. Yeah, and I know what you're saying, but in the end it makes it harder because you actually, when you're involved in that kind of addiction with spirits all the time, it can get very confusing about what is you and what is them mm -hmm. if you become so accustomed to them helping you out of a, out of a sticky situation or what you feel is an uncomfortable situation and they step in for you. Over time, as has happened for you, you know, when that's happening for a long period of time, you can get to the, to the end of a month and say, what was me? Or the end of a day and say, what was me and what was them? Because the line, you're blurring the line so much. So I feel it's really good that you're beginning to develop this sense of when you leave your body. And the other thing I would work on, Mon, is just this feeling of, of you n needing to have emotion. You know, I, I see this in some of you, this feeling like, 
We all know that Jesus said we should be humble and that's how we're going to get truth. And so if we cry, it's going to be good, you know. And I was saying to someone last night, it's like doing push-ups. You think if you just got tears rolling down your face, then you're getting somewhere towards God. And it's not like that, you know. It's, when you're really humble, it's quite um, uh, edgy, is what I said before. You know, you feel like you're confronting the edges of your comfort zones all the time. And that means that sometimes you're not going to be crying, you're going to just feel uncomfortable or you're going to feel like, oh, you're going to feel more like, oh, I've got to stay in my body and I really want to, you know, all of the addictive ways we've used to get away from emotion. Mm-hmm. That's often when we, we start to become humble. It doesn't look like a big histrionic, crying sessions it looks like oh wow this feels oh strange uncomfortable difficult you know oh I know what love would do here I'm gonna do that but gee whiz I'm challenged and that's that's the beginning of humility and that's the beginning of how God can connect to us and then when we do cry it's very often a deep like um, feeling that you want to have in private a feeling that is between you and God, a feeling that you know is like really changing you or you've never been to that part of your soul before. I've never been to this feeling before. You know, it's not just having a cry randomly, you know, yeah. Yeah, just reflecting on on what was happening with Marie, I've just been realising that I don't actually want to be humble just like Marie. Yeah. I'm thinking, whoa... I don't. I haven't wanted to surrender. I I want to be resistive. So yeah. what the has been the rest of it? Exactly. And I'm having a hard time staying a yeah. lot of the time in my yeah. body. Yeah. And that's the truth of it. That's. And Mon, uh, do you know? I just feel that's the best place to start. You know, start with I've that anger that I talked about that nobody loved me. That anger is the place to start, and the feeling I want to leave my body all the time. You know, that's the beginning of humility. That's a big step. That's a place that sucks so much. I know. See what I mean about humility? It feels uncomfortable. <laughs> it feels like, oh, you know. But that's when you grow. Yeah. Uh, and? And actually Marie demonstrated that when um, Fred went to her to hear the story. She actually had that feeling. She had to choose again. Yes. And... and and choose her to feel the fear and the dread that she knew was going to come up because she had to tell her story again. Yes, beautiful Angela. That's exactly what happened, yeah. So she was, she's developing humility. She's feeling that, oh, I'm going to choose love and it's going to feel uncomfortable thing, yeah. And she's growing, yeah, yeah, beautiful. All right, uh, Diana, and we'll finish up soon. I think it's five, so... It was just another aspect to when you asked the question of like why, you know, did they introduce Fred to Marie and everything. And, yeah. and I, when I just read this whole story, um, I just felt what a gift Marie's story is for me. Yeah. And for everybody else who reads through the mists. Yeah. And that possibly was part of why Kushner, you know, took Fred yes. to Marie knowing... What was going to happen, yep. you know, with, with Fred's desire. Yeah. And, yeah, she's just demonstrating to me, like, this humility. Yeah. A beginning humility, the process of it, like... Yeah. And the yeah. gifts that come when we embody humility. Yeah. Like, the multi-layered, multi-faceted gifts that go way beyond our experience and reverberate out into the world when we walk in humility like Marie is just practicing humility in that one afternoon in the spirit world and here we are like 100 years later talking about her experience all because she made that choice uh, and it, it reverberated into Fred's life and now into our life and and if we really take her her lessons the lessons she's learning to heart then it reverberates even further doesn't it yeah, so there's a lot of power in humility. Mm. Yeah, Deb? We need to finish soon, guys. I, you can leave if you need to leave because we're running uh, over um, time. I just wanted to ask if you've heard from Marie. Um, I'm kind of guessing she's possibly a celestial now. Yeah, yeah, I feel that she is. I haven't spoken to her, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I've been a bit... Um, She's got to be here, surely. Surely. <laughs> surely, yeah. Helping us all. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's so much talk about her, you'd think she'd have to be here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I feel she's doing really well. And um, that that feeling, you know, that she had the will in her life, the strength in her will, and and then the very humbling experience of understanding what it means when you use your will in disharmony with love is something that motivates a lot of people after they pass to to try to assist people to understand this before they pass. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any final burning questions before we finish off Chapter 9? Christiana, if you pass behind you. Um, Going back to her telling the story to Fred, and it's obviously a very remedial process for her, Um, but I wonder what the fine line is, or if there is a fine line, it might be a wide gaping existence of, in a, a remedial sense and a humbling sense, as opposed to telling the story and just going over it and over it and over again without actually getting anywhere or burdening yourself upon somebody else to get something from somebody else. Yeah, that's a huge gap, actually, if you think about it. In one, we're using our will in disharmony with humility and then the other in complete harmony and you know before when I was talking to Mon about spirits coming and having their emotions through her uh, they're actually in a state of commiseration Mm. they want commiseration from people around them and they're essentially doing that telling their story or living this this emotional experience in order to get commiseration from people and to get involvement from people. Now, that's very different to Marie telling her story to Fred in all humility, isn't it? And so there's many spirits in the spirit world, just demonstrating through that example, who wish to just live in the story and want commiseration for it rather than actually healing through it. And then they want to... um, they want to have people in agreement with the injury. They want to have people in agreement with the fear that they had and the pain that was done to them, that it was terrible and they should never have to deal with it. And so they're just c- crying kind of effect-based and very commi- trying to garner commiseration-based tears that are not actually healing them. Yeah, um, um, I'm just getting that um, each time for Marie, as she was telling the story, she would... Uh, see something, a new aspect of what she was doing, yep. a new feeling that would come into the place of, um, as she was telling the story, a, a new, oh my God, you know, yep. I did that sort yep. of thing. So yep. that would be the difference. Yeah. yeah, because she's engaged in humility and she's actually wanting, you know, now she wants to see herself. Then that process of telling the story is about connecting to herself as she does it yeah so it's a good lesson for you guys to think about in terms of your interactions with others in storytelling AJ's just got his hand up yep yeah. um, I find it interesting in a way that nobody's considered that Fred had actually asked her to tell the story so uh, if we're telling stories and we've not even considered whether the people who are listening to the story want to hear it, Yeah. then that's a great indication of whether we want commiseration or whether we want to actually feel our emotions. Like, if, we're, if, if somebody comes along and says, please tell me your story, then this is a great opportunity to tell your story. If somebody, if somebody comes along and sits next to you and then all of a sudden you start telling them the story and you haven't even asked them whether they want to hear your story or not, <laughs> then that's a great indication that you're forcing <laughs> it all upon them, yeah. which is actually very damaging. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good point, babe. <laughs> it's a good way to measure where we're really at. <laughs> and if the person starts glazing over while you're telling the story, <laughs> that's another indication. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Rose, yep. How important is it that I I fully appreciate that she's repenting for the actions she's done as an adult? Will it be necessary for her to access some unfelt childhood emotions for her to truly heal? Absolutely, yeah. She has to do that, yes. Mm. In order to understand what why and how, like emotionally understand why and how she did these things, she has to connect to the emotions in her childhood. But if you think about it, she is doing that already in this story, is she not? 
Because we often associate pain, unfelt pain in our childhood with the reasons why we take unloving actions towards others. Is it always that case? Well, if I can just share, I've been looking at, as a result of reading her story, how I have committed errors towards other people. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking at the patterns of that. And so yesterday I was really asking, so what's the unfelt emotion that I did not want to feel as a child that caused me to live out that pattern of error mm -hmm. and harming others? Mm -hmm. and, you, and you're searching for those emotions. Yeah. Yes. So here's the thing that I feel about repentance. When we really engage repentance, we connect emotionally with what has happened and we, we, des we desire to take responsibility for it so much that we're willing to feel what we've caused in the other person. But also because we want to take responsibility for it, because we want to acknowledge how in error it was, we open our heart up to knowing how it came to be in it, how this issue came to pass, what, what was happening inside of us when this happened, what, what was the, the error we were justifying, what was the thing that was happening as it was happening. And as we do that, I believe we end up at the childhood emotions that caused it. So I think it's great that you're asking, but I'd also be asking, Where's my, resi where's my resistance to really feeling what's happened? And am I, f am I beating myself up or am I in repentance? Is there truth in my processing? Remember, we need to desire the truth of what happened to deal with anything causally. We can't, we can't release emotion. We can't engage a process of soul growth without desiring the truth of what really happened. So we can't cry. I can't cry for Hurt and Kel for stopping her in a story and so oh, was it really hurt her and I did a bad thing and everything if I didn't actually, if it wasn't actually an error. You know, that's me avoiding some other thing. Maybe I feel afraid of what's going to happen with Kel like now when I cut off first I don't feel afraid Kel but it's an example <laughs> um, what's going to happen you know now that I cut her off I can I can get into self-punishment and cry try to repent and say sorry to Kel when actually the real feeling I'm avoiding is I'm petrified that Kelly might be angry with me now because I cut her off so I have to want the truth of what's really occurred so sometimes like remember uh few meetings ago, Rose, you were talking about trying to repent about how you'd been harming your parents. And I said, be very careful there, you know. You actually need to connect to what the truth is, what really happened. And as you do that, yes, you'll grow in love towards your parents, but you can't actually repent for something in a situation where you, you know, you were completely powerless and had no control over what was happening. The repentance comes from the things in our adult life when we'd used our will in disharmony with love. And when we really engage that, I, I do believe that we, it will be a process. It won't just happen in one sitting. And like Marie, we'll go back to it many times, but there'll be a seeking in our heart to, to know what, what caused it. But our emotional process will take, it, take us there, not our intellect. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. yes. And, and in answer to the other question I posed earlier about Marie's childhood suppressed pain, some of the things she's having to deal with is not her suppressed pain, but the fact that she had a sense of entitlement. And as Kel pointed out, sometimes you receive a sense of entitlement by not getting things and you get angry. But sometimes, like in the case of Marie, you, you gain a sense of entitlement because you were given everything without question. And so then you have to actually grieve the pain that what you thought was truth is actually in error. So that's a pain in itself. It's not that somebody has physically hurt you or shut down your emotion. It's that someone has harmfully inculcated in you the, f the feeling that you're entitled to things and now you have to grieve the fact that that's not true. So partly that's 
that's the emotions that she was holding on to from childhood that she's working through. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Okay, guys, let's leave it there. Thank you very much. And... Um, AJ and I were going to be going away next week, but we're not. We'll be here for another week. So, is Joy, did you have a chance to check next, next Wednesday? Um, and hopefully everyone got... Uh, you, all of you got the message that it's Wednesday, not Thursday. I hope there's no one that missed it. Um, yeah, so next Wednesday here at three. And... Mergen? No. Okay, all right. So if you just look out on the blog and the website, there might be a seminar coming up in a, in a next weekend-ish sort of range, but we need to find a venue. So, yeah. All right, you guys. So chapter 10, next time we meet. Awesome. <laughs> See you. <ya. laughs>